Morning. How's everybody doing this morning? If it's not good, don't answer. <laughs> Brother Daniel, how are you? Good to see you. It's great to be here this morning on a beautiful Sunday. Gorgeous outside uh, today, and God is so good to us. Um, let's start with prayer. I know we have some uh, prayer needs. Sister Sherry just let me know about a four-year-old girl that's a friend of their family's who's um, been having some seizures, and they found a, a mass in the brain, and they're going to be facing the brain surgery and all of that. That is, that's not a minor thing, so we want to lift, lift that situation up. What's her name, Sister Sherry? Taylor. Taylor. All right, let's lift Taylor up this morning. Uh, if you have any other, any other needs in the house, just signify it with the raising of the hand. This is going to be a great day. You're not here by accident. You're not here by coincidence today. This is not just another date on the calendar. This is the day the Lord has made, and I'm excited for what he's going to do. Let's go to the Lord right now. Father, I thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for your people who have gathered together on a Sunday morning, Lord, to hear from you, to learn from your word, to, to open our minds and our hearts to what you would have us learn and hear today. Lord, let us be receptive to it. God, I call down your blessings upon this class this morning, and for anyone watching on the web, Lord, I pray that your spirit would just consume us, and Lord, we lift up Taylor to you this morning. God, you know what that family is going through and what the emotions they are facing, and God, I, I, that's not the only need in the house today, and you are the supplier of all, and I thank you that for your word. I thank you that your promises are true. I thank you that you took stripes on your back for our healing, and your precious blood is still just as effective today as it was 2,000 years ago when it was first shed. I plead your blood over this class today. Let your perfect will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, <clears throat> amen. God bless you. You may be seated. So good to be in the house of the Lord today. What an incredible week we've had with our uh, special revival services. Uh, I actually had to travel for work this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but uh, thanks to our awesome media team, I was able to uh, be in church remotely in the hotel room Tuesday and Wednesday night uh, watching online. It's, it's, a good, it's good, it's a good thing, but I'm... Just telling you, there's no substitute for being here in the atmosphere of, of those services, although you can still feel the presence and power of God uh, through the airwaves while watching it online. But uh, what an incredible, incredible week. And uh, you know, something Brother Tisdale said <clears throat> Monday kind of was the, the launching point for my message here this morning. He mentioned about, uh, you know, it being a sacrifice to come, and, and he was very reluctant to use that word, but, you know, on one side, we, we totally understand what that means, what he meant by that. And on the other side, looking through the spiritual lens, we totally understand why he would be reluctant to use that word in the first place, but uh, it really comes down to our priorities and, and our mindset, and that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> known as the chapter of faith. I'm going to start at verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing where he went. He left. He answered the call of God and departed from where he was, not knowing exactly where he was going. Verse 9, he did this by faith. He sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And we know that faith <clears throat> is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's what we learn in Hebrews 11 and 1. And we can hope for many substantial things by faith. There's many substantive things we can hope for by faith, and that honors God. There's no doubt about that. God responds to faith, and it honors God when we pray bold prayers and big prayers, and we exercise our faith. But Hebrews 11 teaches us another powerful concept about the essence of faith, and it really speaks to the very root and foundation of faith, and we have to embrace it, and that is a unique mindset. With faith comes a unique mindset. We are supposed to have a different mindset when we are walking 
by faith. <clears throat> Later on in the chapter, Hebrews 11, verse 13. Hebrews 11, if you're not familiar with it or maybe you don't remember, it talks about uh, many of the scriptures start off by faith Abraham or by faith Sarah, by faith Enoch, or by faith so-and-so, by faith so-and-so. And it gives a, a, a list of the great men of faith throughout scripture. And in verse 13 it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They were walking towards the promises and were persuaded of them. They were convinced. There was no doubt in their minds and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. There was something about these promises that they were after that caused them to feel uncomfortable or uneasy here on the earth. Verse 14, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out. In other words, if they had kept their minds on where they were, on their previous home, on their former country, on the land and the, the territory that they grew up in or where they were, they might have had opportunity to have returned. In other words, they could have gone back. If their minds were stuck in the past or if their minds were focused on where they had come from, they would have been very easily tempted to return, to go back instead of pursuing forward the promises of God. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly, a heavenly country. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be their God, to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Folks, this world is not our home. We're going to a city. We're working towards something. We're on a journey from here, this present world, to a heavenly place. And it's fascinating to study in Scripture uh, what's called eschatology or the end, end of the world or things that are, that are to come. Uh, and and I'm, I don't, I'm not an expert at that, but reading and studying recently about heaven and what the Bible says about heaven, this world is so lacking. The, the, the wealthiest person in this world doesn't have anything on the poorest person in heaven. That's just all there is to it. But we are to view ourselves, Scripture says, as strangers and pilgrims. Strangers and pilgrims while we're here on this earth. A pilgrim is one who sojourns on earth, one who comes from a foreign country into a city or land to reside there by the side of the natives. That's, that's really how we are to view ourselves. Just like God called Abraham out of the physical realm in the Old Testament, he began calling people out in the spiritual realm in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 27. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There's the connection between God calling Abraham out and in the New Testament God calling Christians out. And that call is still going forth today. Jesus is still calling, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The call is still going forth, come drink from the water that I will give you, the well that I will give you, you'll never thirst again, and it'll never run dry. Come out from among them and be ye separate. That's what the call that's coming to the New Testament church, to, New, to the New Testament uh, generation, if you will. When we are born again, we are essentially being born into the kingdom of God. We're born into the physical realm, of course, on our birthday, but then when we are born again, we, that is our spiritual birthday, we are born into the kingdom of God. We are no longer only of this world, but we are citizens in heaven's kingdom, and we essentially become dual citizens. We have dual citizenship. I work with a lot of guys who are from overseas, some from Sweden and Germany, and many of them, if not have it already they are pursuing what they call dual citizenship so they can be citizens of the United States and enjoy all the benefits uh, that the U.S. provides but also maintain uh, their citizenship in the country that they came from that's kind of how it is with us now on the earth once we're born again we are still citizens we have earthly bodies we're, we're still here in this world but we are no longer of this world we have a, a, a citizenship in God's kingdom that supersedes that 
of our physical citizenship. Physical bodies temporarily, but souls eternally. And when we are born again, we are not the same as we were when we were born the first time. That's, there's some, some changes that are supposed to happen. The, the old person passes away and a new creature emerges with the same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Now we are different. We have a new reality, a new realization of what's important. And we should have new priorities now our journey through life is no longer geared or should no longer be geared just towards how much money we can obtain and how successful we can be to the world standards, but we have a different goal. We have different objectives. Different things become more important. No longer do we live by the mandates of pop culture, but we are now sanctified by the truth of the Word of God. Scripture says we have obtained mercy and having obtained mercy, though we are still in the world, we are no longer of the world. Two little prepositions, two two-letter words, but they are so, so important. In is very different than of. We are in this world, but we are not to be of this world. The world is not to give us our identity. Our identity does not come from this part of the citizenship. Our identity now comes from heaven. We are now strangers and pilgrims in a foreign land. One man said we are to look at ourselves as foreign missionaries, though we may never leave our city or our locale. One songwriter put it like this, Sometimes it feels like I'm watching from the outside. and Sometimes it feels like I'm breathing, but am I really alive? I won't keep searching for answers that aren't here to find because all I know is that I'm not home yet, and this is not where I belong. Take this world and give me Jesus, because this is not where I really belong. And the ultimate challenge is to live in this present world with our hearts and minds set on the world to come. That's a challenge, is every day we still have flesh. Every day we have to be in this world. Every day we have to get up and go to work and we have to do things and make ends meet and we have to, to, to do the best to our, of our abilities to, to succeed and to raise our families and to, to, make, to, to keep living life and to, you know, life happens and we have bills to pay and things to take care of. But the challenge, and we have to, we have to meet this challenge head on and understand it for what it is. Live in this present world, but have our minds focused and set on the world to come. A wealthy plantation owner once invited the famous preacher John Wesley to his home. The two rode their horses all day, seeing just a fraction of all that the man owned. At the end of the day, the plantation owner proudly asked, Well, Mr. Wesley, what do you think? After a moment's silence, Wesley replied, I think you're going to have a hard time leaving all this. A.W. Tozer said, The church is constantly being tempted to accept this world as her home. And sometimes she has listened to the blandishments of those who would woo her away and use her for their own ends. But if she is wise, she will consider that she stands in the valley between the mountain peaks of eternity past and eternity to come. The past is gone forever and the present is passing as swift as the shadow on the sundial of Ahaz. Even if earth should continue a million years, not one of us could stay to enjoy it. We do well to think of the long tomorrow. It's about eternity. It's about living in this present world with eternity in our hearts. James says our lives, he has got, he's got the, 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 probably one of the best illustrations of what it means, present versus eternity. He said our lives are but a vapor. Here today, then poof, gone, never to return. And that's what eternity is. And, and I saw this illustration, and I want to share it just because it, it, I've never forgotten it, and it seared, seared this visual in my mind, it's a string here. Thank you, Sister Becky, for loaning me this string. I'm not going to damage it. it can, it'll be rolled back up after. But there's a, a long string, and if we drug that string all the way around and wrapped it around the world as many times as you could, this much, this little centimeter long length of string represents our lives. If you live to be 40, 50, 60, 100, 120, this much is 
present world, this, our present reality. This much of this string represents the time we have on earth compared to an endless, an endless amount wrapped around this entire world. Compared to eternity, this is nothing. This is just a blip. This is just a blink compared to what's really going to last. This world, this us in this world, our physical bodies, it's not, not going to last. We're just here, God says, by 70 years, by strength 80, if we're, if we're lucky. But we know that tomorrow is not promised to any of us. What is promised to all of us is eternity. This world and everything in it will one day pass away. It's temporal. But the blessed assurance we have is that we're no longer living for this world anyway. Amen? We're not here living for this temporary, temporal world. Our mindset has to be focused on eternity. We must understand that we're just passing through. We're just here for a little time. And the decisions we make and the actions that we take are what will have eternal consequences. It's the greatest investment you could ever partake of. God says invest your, your physical bodies, your, your reality while you're on the earth and the rewards are going to be eternal. Invest what you have, what I've given you, your time, your talent, your treasure. Invest what you have now in this little short blip on the grand scale of time and it's going to pay dividends forever. We must have a stranger's mindset. We must have a pilgrim mindset. Now, Randy Alcorn in his book, Money, Possessions, and Eternity, said this, A startling thing has happened among Western Christians. Many of us habitually think and act as if there were no eternity or as if we would do in this pre what we do in this present life has no eternal consequences. Our devotion to the newspaper and neglect of the Bible is the ultimate testimony to our interest in the short range over the long range. Being oblivious to eternity leaves us experts in the trivial and novices in the significant. We can name that tune, name that starting lineup, name that actor's movie debut, and detail the differences between computers and four-wheel drives. None of this is wrong, of course, but it is revealing when we consider that most Christians, let alone the general public, do not even have an accurate picture of what the Bible says will happen to us after we die. We major in the momentary and minor in the momentous. What an indictment for us today. God has been calling men and women to the holy pilgrimage of obedience since Genesis and is still calling men and women today. Jesus told his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. He was going to lead them on a spiritual pilgrimage that would pay dividends for all eternity. And if you've never studied or read what happened to all of the disciples and the early Christians, they were sold out. There was no going back. They lived for eternity. Once they had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and were filled with the Holy Ghost and began spreading the gospel, it didn't matter what happened, stoning, persecution, crucifixion, you name it, there was no going back. They no longer lived for this present world. It was all about the world to come. God called Abram and changed his name to Abraham, and he called him to leave his country. Everywhere your feet touch, he said, will be your land. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. It was a covenant. Once you separate yourself as a pilgrim walking by faith, and this is the very essence of walking by faith. You walk by faith. You walk with eternity in mind. And what happens is that that manifests itself in consecrations throughout your life. And, and once you do that and you walk by faith, you begin acting by faith. And then miracles, signs, and wonders follow them that believe. It's a, it's a beautiful cycle. It's a beautiful process when you walk by faith. But it starts with our mindset being focused on eternity, on the kingdom of God, and not temporally here on ourselves. Once you separate yourself as a pilgrim walking by faith and not by sight, following the word of God by default and by extension, you step into the will of God. Abraham set off on a pilgrimage based on the word and the promise of God, and it became his reality. The text that we read said they were no longer mindful of their past. They were consumed with the promises of God that were to come. They embraced them, Scripture says. They embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. It's the will of God that we view ourselves as strangers and pilgrims 
here on this earth. We are not supposed to feel like, let me just say it like this, we are not supposed to feel like we fit in or blend in. We're not supposed to feel comfortable and, and like we really uh, fit in with all of this world, with what's going on in the world. There's, there should be a longing. There should be a, 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 a raising of our eyes towards heaven because we realize that, hey, our, our identity is no longer defined by what's here on earth. But once we are bought with a price, when we are born again of water and spirit, we become his. We are born into the kingdom, and we are no longer our own. Our identity is defined by him. And the story of Abraham's journey provides us a great warning about how important it is to live and to have the right mindset about our world. Abraham set out on a pilgrimage, but he didn't go alone. He went with a man named Lot. And after a while, <clears throat> their servants couldn't get along, so they decided to split up. The story is found in Genesis 13. Abraham continued on his journey. Lot stopped, and the Bible says he pitched his tent towards Sodom, meaning he set up his tent facing the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Six chapters later, in Genesis 19, Lot and his family are no longer in a tent facing Sodom. Lot and his family are not only in the city, he is sitting at the gate of the city when the two angels came to him. This wasn't just by accident. He wasn't just a visitor sitting at the outside of the gate. He, he started off with a tent facing the city, but ended up sitting at the gate of the city. Everyone that came in or out of the city saw Lot. His identity became synonymous with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He was now identified with the city. At the gate was where the... the Businessmen sat and they would, you know, trade and do their, their, their bidding and to collect money and all of those things. Not only that, but his entire family, his kids and grandkids are entrenched in the city. He lost his identity as an outsider and his identity became part of that wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. Somewhere along the way he had lost sight that he was supposed to be on a pilgrimage. Somewhere he had lost sight that he was had been called by his, his uh, uh, uncle Abraham to come and to follow him on his journey where God was leading. Somehow he had stopped moving towards that promise of God and had become stuck. He had, he had gotten entrenched. Over time he had forgotten that he was not supposed to fall in love with his current environment and he, because of that, settled far, for far less than what was promised and he had to pay an awful price because of it. It wasn't God's intention for them to stop and fall in love with the world. It wasn't God's intention for them to set up shop in Sodom and Gomorrah. Church of the living God, we cannot lose sight that we are living for eternity. We cannot lose sight that we are walking towards something that this world cannot give us. We are heading towards something. We are reaching for something. We are after something that cannot be found in this world by this world. It is not of this world. We are only here for a very short time, and we must remember the words of John in 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. It is a divine challenge, and it's not always easy because we still have flesh we still have fleshly desires and lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. But every generation of believers has to fight this fight. To love not the world means we live today with the long tomorrow of eternity in mind. It means I live for a higher purpose, to please a higher being. It means I'm not going to sell out to this world for anything. Scripture says, buy the truth and sell it not. It's worth more than anything, than any amount of money. It means I have priorities that may not be fully understood by other people. I love this story. Two men owned farms side by side. One was a bitter atheist, the other a devout Christian. Constantly annoyed at the Christian for his trust in God, the atheist said to him one winter, Let's plant our crops as usual this spring, each the same number of acres. You pray to your God and I'll curse him. Then come October, let's see who has the bigger crop. When October came, the atheist was delighted because his crop was larger. See, you fool, he taunted, what do you have to say for your God now? The old farmer smiled and said, what you don't understand, friend, is that my God doesn't settle all his accounts in October. 
meaning there was more to come than just what meets the eye here on the earth. It's been said that some people are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good, but I would contend today that a far greater indictment is to be so earthly minded that you are no heavenly good even while here on earth. C.S. Lewis, the famous spiritual Christian philosopher, said this, If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English, English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think about the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. Paul said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And that's a powerful statement when you consider all of the parameters and consider the, what, what it means. Jesus was here on a mission. He knew he was only here for a short time, and he knew the impact he was going to make would last for eternity. And with that in mind, let this mind be in me as it was in Christ. Let me wake up, Lord, every day on a mission. Let me understand that I'm here only for a short time. And let me know and, and understand that every day I have an opportunity to make an impact that's going to last for eternity. Jesus knew his disciples at the present time and those of us to come would face this exact challenge. He knew it. And the longest prayer that's recorded in Scripture by the Lord Jesus Christ is found in John 17. Elsewhere we read, you know, John 18 we read him praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will but thine be done. And, and other times throughout the Gospels we read about him praying. But John 17 records a lengthy prayer for quite a few Scriptures. And, and I'm going to read it and I want you to just kind of follow along on the screen and listen and, and, and think about what Jesus is praying. This is... Think about it like this. Jesus is praying for us today. He is praying 2,000 some odd years ago, but he's praying a prayer for us today. Listen to the words. Verse 6, John 17 and 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gave me out of the world. Thine they were. They were yours, and you gave them to me and have kept them with thy word. Now they have known all the things whatsoever you have given to me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which you gave me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out of you, talking to, to the Lord. And they believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me, for they are yours. He's praying for the disciples. Verse 10, And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world. The next, next chapter he was going to Calvary. I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name, the name is important, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those that thou gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, speaking of Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Verse 13, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, that's not the prayer, but that thou should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Here's, here's the part for us. Neither pray I for these alone, not these twelve disciples who are right here, not just everyone that I've spoken to here, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's you and I. That's you and I. We have the word of the apostles that we believed and were born into the kingdom. Jesus was praying for you and I. He was praying for us that we would understand we're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world, that we're supposed to be different. And he was praying that we would solidify our identity of, as being born again, as being separate, being dedicated, devoted to him. Sanctify literally means, it's two parts. It means separated from and devoted to. 
That's what the word sanctify means. And he prayed that we would all be different and separate, that we would understand we are no longer of the world. Jesus had a call, and he is still calling his disciples to a movement, to a journey, if I could say it this way, to a pilgrimage through a strange land for the short time that we're here. And his prayer is that we would be sanctified by the truth of the word. The prayer of Jesus can be understand, understood in both contexts. The word truth means reality. It was his desire and it is still his desire that his followers be separated from and devoted to a higher purpose than those who have not yet experienced being born again of water and spirit. We must live with an understanding of a spiritual reality that supersedes the physical. He had already taught them, John 3, verse 5 and 6, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Regardless of what happens this side of eternity, we have to remember that we are pilgrims on a pilgrimage that started with a search for religious freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The only true religious freedom comes with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And we want as many people on this journey with us as possible. Having dual citizenship does not mean we hide or shut in or just try to survive until the Lord comes. He's actually exactly the opposite. As long as we're here in the world, we must pursue excellence in everything we do. Jesus said, when you work a job, work it as unto me. Do it as if you're doing it to me. It's not that it's his desire to... to uh, for us not to be here. That was his, his prayer was that, Lord, empower them to be different. Empower them to maintain their identity as born again in this world. Empower them not to fall into temptation and to evil. Empower them so that they can be a witness and by faith see many miracle signs and wonders to expand my kingdom. As it was for Abraham, it's the will of God for the people of God to enjoy the blessings of God. But it is about a mindset Jesus said, when you're working for someone, work as if you're working for the Lord himself. Doing our jobs well and having the mindset of excellence gains us influence, and we are under a divine mandate to influence this world, not to be influenced by it. While we're in this world, by all means, work hard, be wise, gain influence, help everyone we can, minister to everyone we can, bear the fruit of the Spirit, use the gifts of the Spirit, and do everything in our power to spread this beautiful gospel message that there is a, a global movement gaining worldwide momentum. There is a pilgrimage that you can be a part of of those who the Son has set free. Every day we see the prophetic word of God being fulfilled before our very eyes. Earthquakes, famines, droughts, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, gratuitous violence, unabashed perversion, rampant moral degeneration. And I can't help but think Boy, it won't be long now. It really won't be long now. I've heard many people say it. It won't be long now. It can't be long now. Look at what's happening in this world. It can't be long now. And I do believe we are living in the 11th hour. And Scripture says, surely he is coming quickly. And then the Bible says something kind of, it might strike you as strange at first. It says, comfort one another with these words. The end is coming. Comfort one another with these words. But that's, that's very telling about the mindset that we have to have. If, if it doesn't comfort us, then that should be an indication that maybe our, our hearts and minds are not focused exactly or fully to the extent on eternity that they might need to be. I have found that the closer I am to the comforter, the more comforting those words are for me. Our culture is forcing us to leave the middle ground. It's revealing those who are of the world from those who are just in the world. It really is. It's forcing the issue. Our culture and society is forcing the issue. It's getting harder and harder to blend in one way or the other. It used to be that everyone believed in God, regardless of what church you went to. And I heard a man say the other day, this is the first generation. Our kids today are the first ones that were raised by people who didn't go to Sunday school. Even, even our, you know, most of our, uh, we have kids today who don't come unless their grandparents bring them because their grandparents are the ones who were born and raised going to a church on, on Sunday, on Sundays. But this is the first generation that are being raised by parents who did not go to church every Sunday. It's a reflection of our world. It's getting harder and harder to blend in. The middle ground really is 
disappearing and separation is happening whether we want to or not, whether we really see it happening or not. The sheep are being separated from the goats, as Jesus said, and we are being forced to take a stand one way or the other, the word or the world. Are we going to live by the world standards or are we going to live and operate by the word's standards? And look at how society has changed just over the last 20 or 30 years. The world I'm in now is not the same one that I grew up in when I was a child. Things are accepted now by the masses that, are, that weren't even spoken aloud you know, 20 or 30 years ago, a generation or two ago. And what started out as separation of church and state has turned into a separation of God and country. And I wonder what our world will look like 20 or 30 years from now if the Lord tarries. Whatever it looks like, the fact is not going to change. We are still in this world. And if the Lord tarries, we will still be in this world, not of this world. That is not going to change. We will still be trying to succeed and doing our best at work and raising our families according to the word. We are still going to be making a living. We are still going to be doing the things we have to do while we're in this world. But with the Lord's help, we will not, we will not be doing the things that would cause us to be of this world. We march to the beat of a different drum. Our kids must learn about life on earth. They must learn about how to take care of themselves, how to fulfill their responsibilities as a good citizen. We want them to know how to have fun and how to play sports and all of those things. But it's even more important that they learn that this world is temporary, that we're living this world for something greater, that we're living in this world not, not only to succeed, not, not for what we can gain in this world, because ultimately all of that's going to go away anyway, we're living in this world for what's in eternity. Someone asked uh, John D. Rockefeller, one of the richest men ever in the history of the world, asked, him, uh, asked his accountant after he died, he said, how much did John leave behind? And his accountant said, he left it all. <laughs> Puts it in perspective. In today's money, the guy was worth billions and billions and billions. But when death happened, which happens, will happen to us all, should the Lord tarry, everything is staying behind except what we've invested in eternity, except what we've invested in heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 6, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth because they're going to get corrupted and eventually they're going to burn like wood, hay, and stubble. He said, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where nothing on this world can touch it. Nothing can stop that investment from paying dividends. It's even more important for our kids and our homes to learn that this world is temporary and that we have to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how crazy this world gets, no matter what the Supreme Court said is, says is legal or whatever society deems appropriate, if it contradicts this word, then I know I'm in this world and I know I'm in the United States and I'm a United States citizen, thank God for it, but this book supersedes the law of the land, when it comes to my actions and my behavior. No matter how crazy this world gets, the word of the Lord is truth. And when confusion and deception reigns, the word of truth still sanctifies. We won't do everything right every single day, but we're not going to subvert our identities as strangers and pilgrims in this present world. We are not going to stop moving toward the promise of eternity. And as a church and as a body of believers, we cannot lose focus on what we're really ultimately after. If there was ever a time to embrace the identity of a pilgrim and a stranger in a foreign land, it's now. It's now. The old songwriter said, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I just can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore and I just can't feel at home in this world anymore. First Peter chapter 2, 9, 10, and 11. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Didn't our text call us heirs with Abraham? 
We've inherited something great when we are born into the kingdom of God. And we become a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people but are now the people of God, which, have not, which had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. Verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. In the summer of the year 1620, a small group of 102 very devout believers called separatists, they called themselves separatists, received permission from the king of England to board two wooden ships and cross the Atlantic Ocean. They wanted to set up a new colony in what was known as the Americas in the name of the king. They departed and almost immediately the smaller of the two boats began to take on water, forcing them to turn around. A few days later, everything had been moved to the big boat, 102 men, women, three of whom were pregnant and children, and 25 to 30 crew members boarded the large wooden ship called the Mayflower, which had previously been a cargo ship used to move goods from England throughout Europe. There were very limited sleeping quarters, no bathroom facilities because the ship was 100% wood. All of the food brought along for the journey was eaten cold because fear that lighting a fire would set the ship on fire. It's difficult to imagine what it must have been like for these people to be on a wooden boat in the Atlantic Ocean for more than two full months with little to no privacy or sanitation, especially for the women and children. Finally, after 66 days of traveling at two miles per hour across the ocean, Members of the ship's crew spotted land. It was the Americas. The long and difficult trip was nearing its end, and their planned destination had been northern Virginia, but a storm had thrown them off course as they neared the Americas, and they landed in a place now known as Plymouth Rock. They were called separatists because what they believed marked them as different by the rest of society so much so that they were willing to sacrifice what they had to sacrifice and endure what they had to endure to get from where they were to a land that they had never seen, they had only heard of. They didn't know what it was going to be like. They just knew and believed that it would be better than where they were. When they set out on a journey specifically for religious freedom, they forsook everything to become strangers in a foreign land, and they are now known to us today as the pilgrims. All this effort and sacrifice in time to establish something that would last into the future for their kids and generations to come. How much more should we be mindful of eternity? If people are willing for religious freedom to, to make those kind of sacrifices temporally on the earth, how much more, my God, should I be focused on the Lord and ready and willing to do whatever I can in this earth to invest in the next. Colossians 3, Paul is writing and says this, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And I leave you with this quote by C.S. Lewis. He says, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Would you bow your heads? Father, I thank you so much. God, you've called every single one of us out of darkness into your marvelous light, and there's so many incredible testimonies here, just here in this room today right now. And God, I believe that there are going to be more testimonies after the service is concluded today that will last for eternity. God, I pray that you forgive me, Lord, for the many times and the many days that I've focused more on this present world and present earth than, than eternity. And Lord, the times where I've fallen into temptation because I was focused only on myself and only on the temporary and not on the eternal. God, I pray you help us as we continue in this revival at this church and continue in this refocusing and all of these incredible things that you're doing, all the signs and wonders and miracles that are following those of us who believe. God, I pray that you would be, help us to be ever mindful, anoint our minds. Every interaction we have can be a divine interaction. Everything we do, every, everywhere we go, every time we work, every challenge we face can be an opportunity to show your glory. Let your perfect will be done today, the rest of this day in our worship service. And we love you, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are awesome. Let's come back at 1045 for a great worship service.